not going to be on any tests. It's just this gives us a little brief history of uh, of robots or industrial robots. So we have robots, and then we have something called industrial robots. Uh, this class is Introduction to Robotics, so we'll be dealing with a lot of different types of robots, uh, or talking about different types of robots. But primarily the intent of the course is to get y'all into these guys, right? These industrial robots uh, that we see over there. And we'll play around with them. some of these, except when we play around with them, I'll be using them. If you take the Operation and Programming class, uh, then that will actually, you'll actually start working with the robot arms over here on the other side of the wall, which is pretty neat. So we classify robots different ways. I mean, we have several places. Uh, we have the International Standards Organization, or ISO. Uh, mainly what we deal with here in the U.S. is something called the Robot Industry Association, or RIA. And we'll look at the different classifications, but that'll be uh, probably in the next lecture. So they classified, uh, IRA has uh, about, I think they have five different robot calculations. Uh, the Japanese have like six. Uh, so robots are wide categories in, uh, of what we, we run in. Basically they fall into uh, these basic uh, domains of operation. What do they operate within? So we have stationary robots. These robots that are not known. So if you went down to the Mercedes plant and took that tour, uh, probably a lot of their robots are stationary robots. If you went up to the Bridgestone plant where we got up in uh, Tennessee, uh, they have some mobile robots that they really need. They call them minions, by the way, because they're, they're shaped like the minions off of a typical me. They're yeah, they're kind of rough. So mobile robots. Uh, so eventually, we're uh, eventually, you know, it's a big push. Uh, auto manufacturers is basically turning their car into like a self-contained, self-driving robot, which are basically programmable. Uh, we'll find out we have pretty industrial robots that have these programmable. You're going to have GPS on the thing. You can do a lot. Can be very very user friendly. Underwater, we're seeing a lot of those. Uh, they just found the Indianapolis. Indianapolis was a ship that was lost during the World War II. Uh, they were uh, into they were transporting uh, parts of the atomic bomb uh, to uh, where did they take that off on Guam? Midway, I don't know. Uh, and when they came back, they got torpedoed. It took them like two or three days to find them. People. It was on Jaws, the movie, by the way. They had a bunch of people that were killed by sharks. So really, really neat. They finally found it in 18,000 feet of water. How did they find it? Well, you know, robots, underwater robots. So we have a lot of those that do the aerial robots. We have the drones that's so popular in the military, and even that's moving into commercial uh, quadcopters, some of the quadcopters, the true drones. Program. Uh, they're doing a lot of things now, but helicopters. I just read where they're using a lot of drones to check out these high tension, high, high electrical wires to see if they've got any problems using these air robots. Uh, we have ground robots that's operating on Mars right now. These are robots that move around. They talk to them every once in a while. You know, it takes like 30 minutes uh, for information to get up to the robot. And those have got to be programmed. They say, okay, we want you to go here, and then just let it go, right? Uh, microgravity robots. We have robots that are programmable that's flying around our Earth right now, all over the place. You know, field synchronous satellites, uh, GPS satellites that they can move around and reprogram and do different things. So we have robots that are all over the place. And then we have robot war wars, too, which is not an industrial robot. We'll look at the different classes. Uh, autonomy, it doesn't mean that they're self-reliant, right? You understand? Autonomy means 
that they can basically do things on their own. But what we'll find out on these robots is that when we see the amazing things these robots do, all these robots are what we call programmers, which means what? I mean, some person somewhere wrote the program for these robots to do what we, we see and do. But once once the program is written, and then they execute that program, they're basically autonomous. They go out there and they just, they just do their task. How long do they do it? You know, this is what's really revolutionizing the industry where they have things that used to be done by humans, but it was, it was a repetitive task. And they did the same thing over and over and over and over and over and over. Well, if you could program a robot to do that over and over and over and over and over again, well, what's the advantage of doing it with a robot? What's some of the advantages to doing it with a robot? They don't get tired. They don't, we don't pay them overtime. They don't take restroom breaks. They don't have, don't take lunch. They don't care if they work a 24 hour shift or eight hours. They don't care. You know, y'all understand that. Yeah, we don't have to pay workman's comp. We don't have to do any insurance on this stuff. And they do it at a precision that humans don't understand. As long as you maintain the tools, they will do it exactly the same way a thousand times a day or one hour. We can't do that. We just don't have the ability to do that. So I could write my name a hundred times. I could write my name a hundred times, and there would be something different in every signature. Something different in every signature. I just can't maintain the accuracy of a robot. Now, these robots are accurate to being nanometers. These little robots are accurate to nanometers. So that's basically smaller than human hair. It can go back to the same spot exactly the same way every time. When I was young, the cars you had, anybody had an old car? Engines you couldn't keep from. They were oil. They couldn't make them precise enough to keep oil from slipping out of them. So now, you go out and get a new car, they don't even use, they don't even use gases anymore. Well, they have little rubber things that you can send them to sell them. You know, you can have gaskets and all this other kind of stuff. They don't have that anymore. Now you go out there and look at a car. You know, the only oil you see on it is when got last time they changed the oil and they started oil on And that's what we see now is we see dirt. You know, used to cars, the uh, odometers on cars rolled over at 99,999 miles. And you, you belong to the 100,000 miles. Uh, if you got a hundred thousand miles out of the car, that was very unusual because they could not make them precise enough to maintain that. Now, two hundred thousand miles on a car is enough. They've added another to so our old on. So now we have cars. The guy that sold the automotive code on, he buys a new truck for his home. He don't he don't look at anything under a hundred thousand miles because that, he still has that stigma a hundred thousand miles. And the car that's got 100,000 miles on it, they, they, they sell it for a lot cheaper price. And yet it probably got 100,000 miles left in it. You can just do basic maintenance. So, what we do is somebody writes these programs. And then when they write those programs, that sucker will do that same thing 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They don't care. They don't care what environment it runs in. You send these things into nuclear reactors that do stuff that we wouldn't possibly do. Uh, they got a robot that moves around the output of the space station out there. don't have to put on a space suit or anything. don't care if it's night or day up there, you know. don't worry about it getting down to over minus 100 and something degrees. Uh, you know, when the sun's not shining and enough over that when you need it, don't care. Right? You understand? It's built like right. So autonomous means it can operate properly without intervention or indefinitely. It can deal with unexpected problems. If it's programmed right. If it's programmed right. Uh, if the programmer didn't expect it. It's just like when they, when they write new software for computers. You have the engineers that write it. 
right on center. Then they put it out on what's called beta test. And they give this out to people and let them use it for free. But these are people that are still well versed in computers. So they understand that good. Then they put that thing out commercially. And then that's when the problems pop up. So what do we constantly do? How many times is Windows up there? How many times is your cell phone up? How many times is an application on your phone have that thing? Because when you look at this, making it more reliable, making it, getting it better security. Because what's happening is that it's impossible for us to figure out everything a consumer's going to do when he starts picking up or she starts picking up that mouse or that touch pad and starts hitting that. He didn't expect or the programmer didn't expect him to do this. So we talked to that thing. So when we said it, you know, it can it can deal with unexpected problems gracefully. That's all if it was programmed to do all to deal with it. Right. We'll get into a little programming here. Y'all learned that. Constantly requires a send of, of, of we have what we call uh, manually operated robots, which uh, we don't consider these to be industrial robots. Uh, these would be basically radio control robots. What can a robot do? What can an industrial robot do? This is just a minor list. But what, what do we do? Well, just think about what they do with our cell phone. How some of the things they do. They well, definitely. Yeah, they, they apply adhesives. Uh, they paint the car. Right, you understand. They typically move stuff around. Uh, they do what we call machine pinning, which means they basically just move things between machines. They do a simple, they actually put, put things together. Uh, basically, we can do these robots like this. Uh, we can program them to emulate this guy right here. All the way down to that right And then what we do, we need to do take care of this. Now, what can we do with this? Well, we do a lot of things. And what we do on our robot is we build the tool so all these robots have a tool on call that is direct. But we could just as well mount a regular mount on the mount a piece like this is an applicator, we can mount a welding tool. Right? So they have robots that can change. So it's kind of like a what's the Robin what Robin Williams movie? That just awesome on. Robin Hood, that's how we had all these different tools to snap onto the water. So that's what we call the other thing, knives and stuff. That's basically what these guys are going to do. So uh, the position, the purpose of most of these robots is to position the tool. And then we, we put a tool on them to do what the robot was designed to do. And I could read, I could read, uh, find a robot by doing what? These are just uh, welding application, spray painting, assembly, palletizing, or moving stuff down, dispensing operations, laboratory operations, water jet cutting. We have we have robots now that perform surgery. Where the doctor is in one location and the robot is so precise uh, that they can do surgery. Robot doing work that, that, uh, Repetitive work. Anything that constantly varies that we just can't build it in. So if you went down to the Mercedes plant, uh, the, the guys are still putting the engines in. Now why do they have to put the engines in? Because they can't go in there precisely every time. You got all these wiring harnesses in there. So I can't, I can't have a robot hook up the wiring harness harness it on the car. And I can't have a robot putting in the carpet in the car. I can't have a robot doing a lot of things. And, and plus, anything that requires basically extremely fast on sensing, then this is like the drone. Well, we can program drones to fly. But 
drone was all they do was run a program. So somewhere as an operator, that, that drone might be flying itself, but that, that drone does not make a decision to fire a missile. That drone does not make a decision to recast itself. So we still have somebody in the U.S. It's really amazing to me. We have, we have places in the U.S. where they're flying the drones and where are the drones at? They're flying over in Afghanistan. Still has human inter inter intervention, and uh, there are some companies that don't do that. Uh, so it's, it's hard to say where this is going to end and what. Um, what I'm trying to say is, it's hard to be a robot to take the place of what a human. Does that make sense? But what it does is take a plant that would take, you know, thirty thousand people to build the car. Now they're doing it too. Because the robots and doing all that kind of stuff, you still have humans. Robots still. So let's say a robot is picking up something, comes down and shows it, and it don't quite get it exactly right, and it comes over here and sets it down, and it jams up. Who's going to take care of the day? Well, there's got to be a person. So even that at Mercedes, you have a person who's found and really works. It's just that they're basically in there. And so, assembly plant, we do have, there's a place in, there's a, a assembly plant up in where you have to put together cameras. And basically, there's no people except the start in the end. So, the, the stars think that vary all the time. Uh, the constant don't have to. The problem is, is that you can't have the labor anymore. When we was out at U.S. Steel, wasn't he? he had a whole group that was labor. So they wasn't assigned a job, they did what they did to make sure. So now, if I need somebody to load pallets and stuff like that, and it's the same thing over and over again, those are the type of jobs that do a repetitive job. This is where industrial robots are really, really coming into play. Something that's not repetitive, it's going to still have to be done once. Like, so if it's repetitive, uh, odds are you can, you can do it with a robot. If it's non repetitive, you sure don't have that. So it's something you've got to know, put decision uh, choices on. You know, that if you just can't do it, robots you just can't do it. They, they, they can only make, they're only limited. They're limited by their program. And, and, and operate and programmers cannot anticipate everything that's going to happen. So I've never seen a robot that doesn't need to make a mistake, but it's not the robot's fault. It's, it's, it's a part slides down and it's supposed to go into a gig and something happens and it don't get into the place exactly where it's supposed to be. The robot goes down and picks it up and just don't it picks it up wrong, not because it's because it was in the wrong place. It was in the in the wrong place. We can't put camera systems in there the robot because the more stuff you put in a work cell, the more expensive the work cell becomes. So in robotics we depend on things being in the right place at the right time. So if you ever look at the, the chassis of a new car, it's got pinholes in it. And those are perfectly placed in the chassis. And what it'll do is it'll come down and it'll clamp it down and clamp it into those pinholes. And that way the chassis is in the right place. And then the robot, the, it gets a, the, the program gets a signal saying the chassis is there. And then the robot just goes to the same spot as the program to go to. Well, if the chassis is not in the right spot, the robot doesn't know that, right? Because it doesn't have a camera system on it and all this fancy programming that can cost thousands and thousands of dollars. So now everything is screwed up, not because of the robot, because of what? Because of something else. So you still have humans around that have to take care of uh, Yeah, we've had, we've had these robots over here. Uh, uh, on the Cooper, we got one where we have a program where the robot is constantly Pull, we can tell you that. Pull the blocks out from the bottom and just put them on the top. Well, every once in a while, when you pull it out, it'll tilt a little bit. 
Life was healed, not the robot. He killed it. He came down and said he was tired. And he was clipped aside. And he had, he had so much pressure that a lot was just flying out of there. We started to see over here on this. But it wasn't the robot's fault. It was what? It was the, it was the, it was the, it was the work. So if you got something like that, then of course, we'll go over there, we'll get some manufacturing lines going and try to uh, get a chance where we can do it with the other class next door. We do have one class next door. And we shall see the first time we run it, it's going to have some problems. So things are not going to be exactly right. Now, once it gets in the sink, it'll run all day long. But if you've ever been involved in manufacturing, you'll notice that if you've got a, nine, if you've got a line that's just idle for a while, and you fire that sucker up, there's going to be problems. And once you get it up and running, you get the unions in there to do what? Well, Take care of all those problems and it's going to be easy and pretty reliable. We'll think about it. We can see no wrong on any customer. But it's usually not the robot's fault. It's somebody else. And the more the more sensors you add to a, a work cell, the more expensive the work cell becomes. So a lot of your robots depend on things being at the right place. They don't sense they're at the right place. They take for granted that. So good question. Any more? Of course, we got an educational robots. So that's basically what we're going to build. These are actually full blown robots. They're just small versions of the big guys. Uh, the big fans over there are uh, donated by Mercedes. And they took their assembly line and converted it over to the robots. They donated all, they donated all the fan robots to the big project. Uh, we got two of them. It took us about a year to get it going. Uh, we finally won. We've actually got a, uh, what we call a resistor welder. Some people call it a spot welder. That's actually the welder that goes around and welds the sheet metal onto the car. That's in there. That guy's fully operating. That welder's not operating. If we don't have the power to fill it away. But we decided to leave it so you will actually see, you know, what, what you might run on. Most of these robots are designed to handle all different types of tools. These are educational robots right here. So these are not intended to be used in industry, they're used in the learning world. So you get a little back dinosaur robot because they're really flexible. It's got several sensors that have on there, we'll talk about sensors in a little bit about the sensors. It's totally programmable. It's got everything you make with that robot or industrial robot. So we'll pick up programmable, everybody understand what a programmable uh, programmable. I mean, some human somewhere do uh, program to do what you see in there. So these guys over here with these beautiful boat anchors, they just do what? They run programs. That's who writes the program. Uh, by the way, programming robots, we don't call it programming, we call it teaching. Which is pretty good. So we teach robots to do what we want them to do. And then after we teach them what we want them to do, we walk, then they do. So the Lego is everything that's required and most of your, to be a true industrial robot, they have to be reprogrammable. What does that turn out? Teach it to do something else. You can teach it to do something else. So that would be awful if you get in one of your colonies cars and you have to go to the same place. You want to drive to the same place all the time. But it would take you on the same route all the time. Right? That would be programmable. Somebody wrote that program. Take you that, but it would be awful if you couldn't change where you wanted to go. So, anytime you get it, you can see I'm not kidding about one of those, and you change where you wanted to drive to, then you're doing, you're doing a program. But it's going to be in a language that you understand, right? All this stuff. So, education robots. Uh, there's several out there. <laughs> uh, they don't like what's really, really neat is that you can come up with a design, you can build it. Uh, by the way, you can buy these things. Uh, the newest version they call it the MD3. I think they used to sell them at the leather store down here in Calais. I think it's still down there. It's still there. Uh, around 300 bucks. They're not cheap, but they're really neat. So uh, the base, the first programmable device uh, that ran a, a technology that we used for years, uh, we called it paper tape 
where they basically punch holes in a tape and then it moves through it and when it hits these different holes in that tape, tell the machine to do something else. This is the way we program machines for years. Uh, this technology was first used on this program by home through this presentation around for years. When I first got in it, the basic run the basic running of the CNC machine was done on what we call tape now. It eventually moved over to Mylar or plant. So it's paper tape. Mylar was a lot more flexible. And they would just take those things and make them, you had a, a key punch that you would do different things on there and you punch holes into the tape. And then when it ran it, they would have things or fingers that came into the tape. I saw it blow air through those holes. So it blow air through it and on the other side it had an orifice that it picked up the area to do something. Uh, and then they would just take, they would take it and punch it and then cut it and tape it together. And then put it in the reader and it would just do what? It would just move. It would just move and it would run the program correct. So if they wanted to change what they did, they would just punch another wall. They would just punch another page. That was around when I first got into it. The, uh, the, uh, the programmable machine tools, your programmable lathes and your programmable milling machines were done with those methods when I first got into the industry. And we had some around here somewhere. I don't tell them where it's at. But look! The first programmable loom was done, you know what a loom was done? Uh, it was done in what year? 1801. Uh, CAM operated lathe, the basis of all modern lathes. And then 1892 designed the first motorized crane to remove ingots from a furnace. And then the word robotics was first used in a book, by the way, in 1923, which is pretty new. And of course, it's being used loosely now. Uh, the first ENIAC computer, electronic numerical integrator and computer, uh, this was actually 1946. Anybody know what this computer did? Who had who had all the money? Military. Military. Yeah, this guy here basically calculated uh, trajectory on or artillery. So it did the so if you ever went on a ship, they would look at the distance and they would actually have to do all the math to try to do that. Well, this guy right here would do that all of, set up all that charts for them. So instead of them doing the math, they would just look at the distance and they would look up the code and come up and tell them what the code was. So that's what this guy did. Look at the size of that thing. Your cell phone has more power than this guy. It was actually programmed by moving by moving cables around. So you can see the programming panels right here. So literally to program it, they actually strap the program in. So they run strap in. So that's the way it was done. Couldn't imagine. So these are just some interesting dates. Like I said, this is you're not responsible for this at all. This is just what we're trying to get an introduction to that. So 1948 published the book, right? On, uh, an, uh, communication in animal and machine. Cyber 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 all yeah, cyber metrics. I thought it was metrics. Uh, the study of machines can analyze their surroundings, adjust their operations to fit surroundings. So that's a term that we're not going to worry about. Uh, 1952, developed the first numerically controlled machine tool. And so NC, now we do what we call CNC. So what's the difference between NC and CNC? So CNC is computer control. Now we actually have, so if you go over there to the new machine shop, all our, all our lathes and everything has the CRT script. You get it, you load a program that's going to do what you need to do. 1954, planned, uh, patented the first programmable robot capable of performing an industrial task. Uh, this guy right here, 1960, this was the first assembly robot that was put into a plant. Uh, this is a gentleman 
Machine teaming. Uh, we have machines that constantly move cars. So, uh, we, we got a video, I need to find it. It's, about, it's in one of our stations. It's over in China, where they got this big old prayer. And they've got little holes in it, and four Chinese guys sitting inside of them. And they're taking, they're transferring. So what they're doing is they're coming over here grabbing something and moving over here. Then they all lay down like this and press them down and press them and then they all fell up. <laughs> so that is machine tending. But there you have, so you have an individual that loads the machine and unloads the machine. And that's what machine tending is. Machine tending is just a robot that loads machines. It don't do any assembly. It don't do well and all it does is move material to the machine. And so, when we get over and look at the Amtro line, the Fanuc robot on the Amtro line is a machine tending robot. So it don't build anything, it just moves it between the different machines that's inside the assembly. The Fanuc robot, I'm, I'm sorry, the Mishibishi robot that's on the Festo line, it is an assembly robot. So it literally gets parts from different parts from different magazines. It gets part and does what? And it puts the engine together. So we have two robots over there with four different tasks. One of them is what we call machine and one of them is called assembly robot. So parts handling. So it, the animation started working with companies in Japan starting a worldwide application for robots. This is the first fully electrical robot. It's about all our robots are with electrical motors. So when we talk about the main power source in robotics, it's electricity. Why? Public's all over the place. So a company usually don't have to produce their own electricity, they can buy it, right? The US still can make their own electricity. They still could not produce enough electricity to run the company. So they had their own oil house out there when I was there. So electric, so all these robots are positioned with electric motors. Of course, we have some applications where electricity would be made. But then we move to other power sources. We'll look at that with the power sources and then we can go by. Predominant power sources are electricity. So all these have electric motors and then we can work with it. Uh, now the gripper uh, is run by another power source called the man. So this is why we need Robots that make them come here to those suits and make those into grips. Those are you know, the gray robots. We'll go over in a minute and move them around. And we'll see if uh, we'll see if Britain's next door and we'll see if we can run the lines and then that's all we'll do today. Uh, 1971, this is in my lifetime, guys. Some of y'all know, this is what you build for my lifetime. So we're talking about it's really amazing how advanced this guy is. That's what we call Bull's Bull's constant. Basically it says the power of microphone is the integrated circuit of normal electricity. That's pretty much what it's been true up until now. So right now they're just about just the limit of uh, the amount of uh, the amount of uh, semiconductor transistors that can fit per millimeter of but 1971, first microprocessor. So what they took is they took all the components that were in a, in a processing unit. When I first got in working on computers, um, our central processing unit was actually three circuit boards that contained the processing power of the computer. But what we do now is we have I, I don't even remember how many transistors we talked about. Now, we used to count them over. Uh, now, uh, when we go to what we call integrated circuits, we take all these electronic devices and we put them on a single piece of silicon laser, layer through this unit. We can use billions of transistors to talk about. We get into the new I7 processors. Those are up in the magnitude of billions of solid state of transistors on that one laser. You know, doing the processing section of what we used to do in the market. 
this was the first one. It was basically done for a cash register, which was pretty new. Now, y'all don't remember the old cash register. Yeah, they had a handle on them for a while. When they pull them, everything would come up. All the math was done with gears. So different ratios of gears. So new. And then they finally added the electric motors to it. So they didn't have to pull the handle on the side anymore. They could hit a button and turn things around. That was what was so amazing. Uh, now, of course, and that would be, those guys would be worth a pretty good deal of money. I think Mr. Krabs still needs one of those things. 1973, uh, since, uh, Cincinnati Milcron developed the 2 3 robot. This was widely used in industry. Cincinnati Milcron is no longer in business. So, uh, the main robot manufacturers now, of course, is ADB. Yakawa, which is the motor man robot. And Fanuc, and Fuka, and the Mitsubishi made some. Panasonic makes a robot. So there's a few of them out there. But currently, there are no robots made in the United States. That I know of. One reason uh, cost is a lot. That's the big problem I have. Well, thank goodness for robots. You know, for a long time, we called them foreign cars because it was cheaper to build them over in their country and then ship them over because of the cost of the labor. But since robots are coming into play, it's now cheaper to do what? Make the cars here than it is to ship. So that's why all these automotive factories are moving into the United States is because of robots. So I hear that all the time. Robots takes jobs. Right name something. But robots created over 3,000 jobs right here in the bank. Because if it wasn't for robots, the savings would not be here. They would still be doing that. They would still be making their cars overseas and putting them on big old ships that are specially made for those and shipping those cars over. Well, yeah, they're better. They're good paying jobs, but they can afford to do that. You know, they can afford now. It's actually cheaper for them to make the cars here than to do what? They're still engineered over there. They're still engineered in Japan and Germany. They're still engineered there. But they are made here. Because it's cheaper for them to make them here, even though our wages are higher than it is to what? To make them over there and then do what? Ship them over here. So thank goodness for robots. And what? We have five, I think, manufacturing facilities. I think we have four here in Alabama. Strictly because of robots. Because now it's cheaper to make them here than it is to do what? Make them over there and ship them. 1976, Viacom demonstrated the electrically operated robot arm controlled by a microprocessor. 1977, ASA Corporation offered two sizes of electrically delivered industrial robots that were microcomputer controlled. So we'll look at what makes up a microcomputer and what makes up a microprocessor. Uh, so every one of these robots have a unit on it we call a controller. That's the technical name for it. It is a microcomputer. So it's got everything in it. We'll look at it. We'll open the doors up and I'll see some of these microcontrollers. Uh, on the Lego, it's obvious where that microcontroller is. It's a controller that has a button. This is what you put when you write your program, you want to put it in this. So you see, everyone is robot, everyone is that.
the batteries are for the regular box. These guys have different batteries and charge batteries. So uh, we'll make sure they're for the person that charges the batteries. I don't know how long the batteries have been in there. Well, this guy looks like it's got engines on it. Well, it sort of has. So see it figures out which way has the most distance, which is the most clearest before it makes a decision to turn. <coughs> Unimation developed a Puma robot, programmable universal to keep for assembly. So we call these we call these acronyms. And what's an acronym? Use the so what we do, a, a true acronym means we, we take a, a center. A group of words, you pick off the first letter of every permanent word, and then we turn that into another. So we would say Puma is an acronym. Over time, by the way, it's turned into meaning. So we have what we call SEC. So we call that an acronym too. So a lot of times now in computers, we just, we just call the letters out. So it's not a true acronym. To be a true acronym, we would have to create another word, right? Okay. Huh? That robot is in fact you're made of the robot, but it works real good on what we call three long robot. It's just a little bit too long. It's a magnet robot. You know, it's a full half house sticker to lay out of the plane. Uh, this is a robot we call a scar robot. We'll look at this. But notice uh, on this one, this one has vertical axis. You see that? When you look at this robot, all the axes are off, are hard on. And we'll look at this and see the advantage of that. We don't have any of these around here. Uh, articulated robot. Basically, articulated robot means accurate, uh, operating a foundry. So this would be what we call the machine tending robot. So all the robot does is go in there and grab stuff out of the, out of the furnace, right? And then move it around somewhere. This is a six axis robot. We'll look at the term axis. Axis, anybody know what that means? What is an axis? Point about right. something moves. We have what we call linear axis. Straight, straight line axis. And then we have rotary axis. So this was the first. Uh, all of our robots over here all have six axis robots. So it means it has six planes that it rotates. It moves. All ours are rotary axis, so they can move around. Right? Okay. So with six axis, we can do more than you can do with it. Look at that. So we can be more precise than what we can do. So how many actions can we have? Well, on the robot, if you can end the shoulder, since we can do this with the robot, we can do this, right? And we can do this. On the robot, we have to have two actions. So we have two actions to extend the shoulder. And on your elbow, we can do this, right? We have one action. And then what we do is we rotate the rotate around it. So that means we've got an action to do that. Right? And then what we're going to do is we're going to use a foot or a hand. One thing we can't do is we can't rotate around our wrist. So if you snap your wrist down, you can't rotate. So we actually rotate our hand right here. Right? And so on and so forth. Well, that robot has that. So we can simulate this with 
Six axis robots, and we'll go over there and look at that in a second. Uh, hazardous duty mobile robots. We have them that uh, disarm bombs. Of course, these are usually not programmable, they're, they're operate, they're used for operation. They'll string cables out the back end. They very seldom have these bombs, bomb control robots, and work off all of them. So radio frequency is not triggered far. Huh? You see these robots have these cables that spread out from the back. Uh, these are usually not programmable. Uh, they're usually user operator. Uh, Robobug 3 is designed to operate in radioactive uh, areas. What's nice about this robot is it's not limited. Wheels are always limited what you can do with a wheel. Um, so I can't climb stairs. You know, even though I see what the I think time's good. By the way, I was in a motorcycle accident in 19, 2000, uh, 2008. And now we have robots that do what? We have robots that do surgery. Because they can do it so precise. If they can take my, my head and do all these images and everything and find out where something's bad. Then they can take my head and cram it into something so I can put it to sleep and cram it into something so I don't know. And that robot will come down exactly and drill ahead and use the hole and it'll do it exactly in the right spot. A surgeon could not do it. A surgeon could not do it exactly the right angle. A surgeon could be close and they're extremely good surgeons out there. They, the surgeon could not put it exactly the right angle, it could not be exactly the right patient, and the surgeon could not be exactly the right patient. You need to do that to A robot to do it. Right? Makes sense. So we have robots now doing very complicated uh, surgery, doing things that are completely different. So, guys, you'll take a 10 minute break. We'll come around and look at some of the robots, and uh, then we'll call it quick. Let's see if we can get to the, uh, let's see if we, I don't know, this one? I don't have any idea. Just,